it sure is a joy and a delight to be with you guys here today. And you know, um, just a quick fun fact. Today is a rather uncommon day. Um, that's why I really love this opportunity because I'm a bit of an Excel nerd. So what I did as I was preparing for this message, I put into Excel and checked how often is it that we would come together as Jan in January 1 as one church family, as one of the Lord's people, and celebrate the Lord's Day together. Did you know that this day, a day like this, actually happens only once every five or six years. So it is actually a very blessed opportunity to be with you guys all here today to gather together and celebrate and worship the Lord as we also start the brand new year together. So with that, I'll ask for a bit of your help, maybe ask you guys to be a part of the welcoming committee for a while, but could you turn to someone you probably haven't met yet, introduce yourself and greet them, uh, welcome to CCF Eastwood. Could we do that for a second? Can you turn for someone you haven't met yet and introduce yourself? Say, welcome to CCF Eastwood. Man, praise God. And as we start the year, we're making new friends as well. So, you know the reason why I ask that? Because every time I read the New Testament, I always get a picture of what the church is like. And it is a church or a group of people that is marked by one trait, unity and love where they love one another. And it really starts with getting to know one another more. So I think today is a great opportunity to get a start, another move the deal forward a little bit towards that picture and ideal. And for those of you who are probably joining us on live stream, we welcome you as well. Maybe you can greet each other Happy New Year on the chat together um, at this moment. So now as we start our message today, you know, the new year is also a marked by um, brand new beginnings, um, a lot of fresh starts, a lot of new things, new projects that we want to start with. Like, you know, for me and my wife, um, just this month, if the Lord wills, we're actually going to be first-time parents. So that's what we're going to be welcoming this month, this time around, if the Lord wills. Praise God! It's something we're rather nervous and excited about, um, which is also why I might have to take a break from Sunday service after a while after this to get adjusted into that new season of our lives. But you know, what we do is whenever we have questions, since we don't know, we have no idea how to become parents, what we would do is my wife and I, mostly my wife, because she's the more responsible one amongst the two of us, I'm more a bit laid back, she would go to Google and she would ask how to be new parents or how to do this or how to do that. We had to research so much. She had to research so much. How to change diapers, so on and so forth. And I would just be a willing audience um, as I listen to her as she explains it to me afterwards. But you know, apart from what my wife and I search on Google, did you know that um, Google, I think in December, they release their report. Every year they do this. They release their a year in search report. And in this report, this time around, they identified what people mostly search for in the year 2022. And did you know that the thing that people search for the most last year was actually this idea. Can I change? And maybe this echoes with a lot of you today. Many people last year, they were asking, can I change? Can I become better? Can I do this better? Can I become a better father, mother, brother, sister? Can I be better in my work? So on and so forth. And, you know, having been in the pandemic for almost three years now, here's a quick pop quiz. Did you guys know when the first lockdown was announced in Metro Manila? March 15, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, it's very interesting. I researched it quite recently. The first state of emergency was announced March 16, and then the first lockdown was implemented in March 17. So actually, we are almost three years in to a pandemic world, or hopefully post-pandemic world soon. And a lot of us have faced many changes during this pandemic. Some of us maybe have been left stagnant, others may have been thrown around in so much uncertainty. And that's why, in last year, people kept asking, can I change? Can I grow? And in fact, if we look deep down, I think some of us are actually looking for that game-changing move that will really change us for the rest of our lives. A change that will actually lead to everything about us changing, the, the change that leads to all change. Some of us here today 
may actually be looking for a true new beginning. And that's why this is our title for today's message. We are looking for a true new beginning. Deep within our hearts, there's a part of us that is really longing for that fresh start. But here, jumping the gun a bit and making a head start, it's very interesting because as I studied this, I realized this is actually a very biblical idea. This is a very biblical truth, that all of us are in need of a true new beginning. Why, you may ask? Well, as I read in John chapter 3, very interesting narrative. If you have time, you can go back and read it. There's this guy, his name is Nicodemus. He's one of the religious rulers of the Jews at that time. But you know, in the guise of the night, he went up to Jesus because he didn't want to be seen. He went up to Jesus and asked, um, he welcomed Jesus, and in his heart, there was a question. But before he even asked it, Jesus already gave the answer. Why? Because Jesus knew in his heart, he was asking, Jesus, all of my life, I have spent my time obeying these rules, obeying these traditions, obeying the culture, but will I really enter into the kingdom of God? Or in today's words, we can actually ask, will I really enter into heaven? That's the question in Nicodemus' heart. After having obeyed all these traditions, will I really enter into heaven? Having lived as a good man, will I really enter into the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus gave out a straight response where he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one can we read this together, born again. Okay, that's the idea. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus was saying, for you to enter into the kingdom, you have to be made new. You have to be born again. Everything about you needs to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. But here's the thing. Though Nicodemus was so shocked, he was so surprised, he didn't know what he, could do, he would do because he said, how can this be? Because he knew that this meant everything about him needed to be transformed. Further on in the chapter, Jesus teaches us our favorite verse that it is, in fact, available and accessible to all of us here today. Because in the same chapter, you have the most commonly memorized verse, where I'm sure you guys know this by heart, so maybe you can read it together. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. You know, so yes, Jesus said, so that you may enter into the kingdom, you have to be born again. But further on the chapter, he says, this is accessible, this is available, because for as long as in your heart you repent and believe in Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will be saved. You will, in fact, truly be born again. And that's the idea, friends. If you want a concise summary of your true new beginning, the change that leads to all change, we all need to be born again. And you are born again when you believe in Christ as your Lord and Savior. So with that in mind, and that as a central concept, today we will be looking at another narrative, a different chapter. This time, we're going to read Mark chapter 5, verse 1 to 20. And in this story, you will find someone else was in a difficult in dark place, and he too needed a true new beginning. And let's see how this story unfolds. So I asked today my brother Alex to read the verses for us on the screen, and you may follow along with your eyes, with your ears, and with your words if you want, as he reads out to us the narrative that unfolds in Mark chapter 5. Okay, here we go. All right, so please read along with me. They came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes, when he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him, and he had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him 
and shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other? Jesus, Son of the Most High God, I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now there was a large herd of the swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implore him, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission. And coming out of the unclean spirit, entered the swine, and the herd rushed them down the steep bank into the sea. About 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Their herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country. And the people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind, the very man who had the legion, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all the swine, and they began to implore him to leave their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him, and he did not let him. But he said to him, Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went and began to proclaim in the Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. And this is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Brother Alex. So with that, let's bow our heads and open with prayer once again. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day that indeed today is a day that you have made, Father. We thank you for the opportunity to worship as one body of Christ, as one family, as one people of God, Lord, worshiping you and starting the new year, really dedicating our day to you, Father. Lord, a lot of us here are in need of that true new beginning that only you can give. And I pray, Lord, may you be the one to speak in everyone's hearts right now. We dedicate this time to you. We dedicate our hearts to you. And we pray, Lord, grant us this new beginning, this change that will change our lives for the rest of our lives here on earth and for eternity. May each one of us here, Lord, just really come to worship you more and more each day. We love you, Lord. We, we pray all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right. So whenever we start any verse and study, we always go back first to the context, location, location, location. What was happening here before this narrative happened? What was the uh, narrative that was before this? So if we go to Mark chapter 4, you will see that Jesus and the disciples, they had been ministering to crowds, to a large group of people. They have been talking to a lot of people for a time. And finally, they were going to the other side, which usually it meant that you know they're going to be able to breathe a bit, to take some time alone, where Jesus could have some intimate time with his disciples and they could rest a bit. But you know, if you read Mark 4, you'll see that that didn't exactly happen um, so smoothly as they were going to the other side because as they went on, that's when the disciples were tested because a storm had hit and Jesus had basically just calmed the storm. And now that they were on the other side, this is now when our story unfolds. And we'll see what happens right after this. Now, I know this narrative and this verse may not exactly be the most cheerful message as we also greet one another Happy New Year. It may not be the happiest narratives today. After all, we are looking at a crazy naked man who lives in tombs and a bunch of pigs who jump off the cliff. But I promise that today the focus is not on that, but the focus rather is on the power and the authority of Christ to give us the true new beginning that you and I long for. And that's why the outline for today is first, the need, second, the power, and third is the response. And if you find yourself a little bit lost, I'll be explaining it by first bringing the narrative to life for all of you, sharing the principle on what you can take away, and why it is relevant for us today in today's modern age and time. So with that, let's get started. The first one is you and I are in need of a savior. That's the idea. We need a savior. 
So going back to Mark 5, if you have your Bibles, you can follow along. If not, we have it on screen. When he got out of the boat, when Jesus and the disciples got out of the boat, the disciples probably were thinking, finally, after that storm, we can have some quiet time with Jesus. We could rest a bit. We could regenerate, refresh ourselves. But, you know, that's not what happened. Because right after they got off the boat, what happens? There's a guy. <laughs> this guy who seems crazy, <laughs> who's actually seems wild, who came from the tombs, he starts running. He starts running towards the disciples. When you think you're about to be able to rest, no. Instead, there's a guy coming over, running fast as we just got off the boat. And this guy, the Bible describes this as one who had an unclean spirit. Or in today's words, we can call it, he was actually demon-possessed. The Bible calls him a demoniac, in fact. He had an unclean spirit within him. And, you know, it's not just the spirit that's unclean, but if you look at the context on what was happening, a lot of the things in this story was actually unclean. So if you've been studying the Bible for some time, you'd probably already know by now that the Jews, they really disliked things that are called religiously unclean. Whenever they engage or touch something that was unclean, they would have to go through a long, rigorous cleansing process before they would be de deemed clean once again. And so they really dislike things that are unclean. But apart from the unclean spirit that was in this man, many things in the area was also unclean. There were also pigs in the area which the Jews regarded as unclean. The guy ran here from the tombs, which where, it is where you put a lot of dead people, and the dead bodies are rendered unclean. So, so many things in this story are actually unclean to the ordinary Jew. And an ordinary Jew would not even find himself even a mile, a mile near or anywhere near a place like this or a person like this. They would be off, far away. They would not want to engage with anything like this. But Jesus, as we have read and learned so many times in the Gospels, Jesus is more concerned about his purpose, his mission, rather than traditions like this. He will always fulfill his purposes. And that's why, though this man was coming here running unclean, Jesus had a purpose in mind with this man. In fact, this whole time when they went beyond the sea and went to this area, Jesus was only able to do this engagement right here, this story right here. So apart from this man being unclean, there are other things that describe this man. And that's why we have to actually look at the different Gospels. Because some of them have accounts of a similar story, but they gave us additional details. Where in other narratives and Gospels, you will read that this man was not only just demon-possessed, he was not only unclean, he had also been naked. I'm sure you don't see a lot of this around right now, right? That a man would be naked. A man would not, this man had not put on any clothes for a long time. So imagine the disciples. You got off the boat. You were just finished being battered by the storm. You're glad you survived. Got off the boat. And suddenly, from the crib far away, a naked man who seems crazy starts running towards you. I'm sure if you were the disciples, you would be so scared. You would panic. But not only that, he wasn't only naked. The next verses tell us that he was super strong. He had supernatural strength. Think of Superman or any other superhero which, with inhuman strength that you can imagine. This guy had inhuman strength. And the people in the area, they have been trying to bind him down. They've been trying to tie him down. Why? Because again, in other Gospels, we read that he was so violent. He was so aggressive. He was attacking the people that would come near him. So he was super strong. He was also violent. And so the people were trying to chain him down so that he will no longer bother the people passing by. But because he was so strong, no one could tie him down anymore. So you see, naked, super strong, a bit crazy, lives in tombs. But apart from that, and here's the very sad part. The narrative tells us 
that this man wasn't only just super strong and naked, he was also suffering. He was suffering very much. He was suffering so bad that night and day, he was shouting, he was screaming, and he was taking up pieces of rock, and he was hurting himself. For whatever reason, we do not know, but he was definitely suffering so very badly. And so, let's put all of that together. That's the first part. This man is what we call the Gerasene demoniac. And this man, let's recap the descriptions that we've seen from this narrative. This man was naked, hadn't put on any clothing. He was very strong and very violent. And he was out of his mind. He was out of control. He was attacking people left and right. And he was also suffering very much to the point that he was harming himself night and day, screaming and shouting in pain. And so what can you tell from the story? The idea is, you see, this man needs help. This man is in need of a savior. This man needs someone to save him, to help him. Now, before you think that this principle is only applicable for this man, the idea why this is also being revealed to us is that you and I are also in need of a savior. Surely, you may not find a story like this commonplace today. You may not see it as common as you see probably a next McDonald's or Jollibee today. But this was very common in Jesus' time. And at the same time, you and I are also in a similar predicament as this man. And it just comes out in a different way. And why do we say that? Because the Apostle Paul, when he wrote the letter to Ephesus, he says this, that we were once, to Christians, we were once dead in our trespasses and sins in which we were walking according to the course of this world and according to the prince of the power of the air. Now, I don't have the time to explain each word here right now with you guys today. But suffice to say, the term prince of the power of the air is what the Bible uses to call Satan. It's what he uses to call the demon, our enemy. And so what is the Apostle Paul saying? That you as Christians, once upon a time before you were in Christ, you were under the influence and the authority of the world and the demon and the devil. You were under their control. You were under their influence. The Bible tells us we were a slave to sin and we were under the devil's influence. And so that's what's similar between us right now and this demonia. And yes, you may not be an insane man who's naked, who lives in tombs, and who comes running and attacking people. You may not be living that way. But you know, the verse continues on and shows us that this influence may play out in a different way in your life. Because the next verses tell us that we formerly lived under the lusts of our flesh, the desires, indulging the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. So yes, you may not be a naked man living in tombs, but you, once upon a time, were under the influence and captivity of this world and of sin, and living to indulge your flesh and the lusts of your flesh and of your mind. Now suddenly it sounds similar, right? Let me give you a few other casts of characters so that you get an idea of how this influence plays out in their life. Let me give you three more. You have the Samaritan woman, or the woman by the well that we know of. She has been living her life in adultery. She has been living with different men, and she has been living in with someone who was not her husband. The influence of the world played out in the lusts of her flesh for this woman. Or you have Zacchaeus, the tax collector, who actually was a tax collector employed by Rome, but he was also stealing from his own people. He was defrauding them. And it was his greed that was controlling him. Or you have, let's say, the person who wrote this letter, who we highly respect and highly honor, the Apostle Paul. That yes, he was not lustful, nor was he greedy, but this guy was super religiously, legalistically zealous. 
to the point that he was willing to persecute and murder Christians. Different ways it comes out, but the same idea. They were all once upon a time under the control and the influence of this world, indulging in the lusts of their flesh and in their minds. So as we enter into the new year, I'm showing you guys the need we all have. Because as we enter into the new year, a lot of us were probably thinking of, okay, what am I going to change this year? How am I going to live a better life? I'm probably going to wake up earlier. I'm probably going to read a book a month. I'm going to do this or do that. I'm going to be a better um, person to this, um, to let's say my parents or so on and so forth, which are all good in itself. All of them may not necessarily be bad in itself. But the point that I want to share with you guys is this, that if you have not realized it yet, and if you have not found the true new beginning, the need that you have, the change that you need, is not just a behavioral change, it's not a material change, neither is it a physical change of working out more, let's say, or buying that new car. But rather, the main change you and I all need is a deeply spiritual one. From the moment you were born, we were all in need of a deep spiritual change. And that is our first priority, my friends. That is the need in which that, tra that translates to the change that you are looking for, the change that leads to all change, the change that leads to all things about your life changing. And you know, Augustine of Hippo, or what we, someone who we know today as St. Augustine, as he was commenting about this and thinking about this, he had this to say, that God has made us for himself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in him. This is where you have the idea of every one of us has a God-shaped vacuum that only Christ can fill. It comes from this thought right here. And have you ever wondered why? having spent so many New Year's, probably planned so many New Year's resolutions, thinking about what needs to change for me in the next year. Have you ever wondered why? No matter what you change behaviorally, none of that has ever satisfied you. None of that has ever given you the answer that you are looking for. None of that has ever filled your heart to the brim. Because the need we have, friends, Again, it's not behavioral, it's not material, it's not physical, it's not circumstantial. It's a deeply spiritual change. The change that leads to all things about you changing. Truly a true new beginning. Because you and I are definitely in need also of a Savior. And here's the good news. Here's the comfort. Because we don't end with the need but we also see the power. Where can we find the power to change, the power to be saved? For only Jesus has the power to save. So let's go back to our narrative now. As we go back to the story, we find ourselves opening the book once more. So this, again, the disciples have gotten off the boat. Jesus went out of the boat. A naked, wild, crazy man comes running immediately towards them, what do you think would have happened? If you were the disciples, if you're watching the scene unfold, you'd probably be scared because like, oh no, Jesus, we're about to be attacked by this person. This man seems crazy and he seems to be, have a violent agenda against us. But instead, what happens? When this man arrives as he runs, to their surprise, he does not attack. He does not become violent. Instead, he prostrates himself. He bows down. And the Bible actually uses the same Greek word which is used in bowing down in worship. This demon-possessed man comes running. He's very violent, very aggressive, but he comes running and he finds himself bowing down, submitting to Christ. Why? And here's the very surprising part. You'd think the demon's and the supernatural forces here that are against Christ don't know who he is, but in fact, they have very sound theology. They have very sound doctrine. They have sound understanding. Because what does the demon call Jesus? He calls Jesus 
son of the most high God. Even when the general public doesn't fully understand who Jesus is yet, and maybe not even till long after that, the demon already calls him, sound, with sound doctrine, the son of the most high God. And this is what you guys need to remember. He is, in fact, the son of the most high God. So that's why we have to read it together, okay? so that you can remember. Okay, let's read it together. Son of the most high God. That's who Christ is. That's why he has authority. And in fact... The demon's term he uses for Jesus is consistent with the what the angel Gabriel told Mary, right before she was about right about before she conceived Jesus, that Jesus would be the Son of the Most High. So the demon had a sound understanding of who Jesus is, and don't miss this thought because I find it wonderful, because here you see that you can really have the right mind but the wrong heart and still not be a part of the kingdom of God. Let me say that again. You can have the right mind, but the wrong heart, but not be a part of the kingdom of God. Because the demons, they knew who Jesus was, but they would never place their faith in Christ. That's why R.C. Sproul has this to say about this whole idea of demons. That Satan and the demons, in fact, they know who Jesus is, but they would never put their personal trust and reliance upon Christ. And that's what sets a believer apart. That we repent, we believe, and we place our faith, the faith that we have for all of our lives, we entrust it to Christ. That's what a believer is. So you may have the right mind, but the wrong heart, and you will still never enter into the kingdom of God. Because the call is to repent, believe, and place your faith in Christ. And here's a little bonus. They don't only have the sound doctrine and sound understanding of who Jesus is. They also know what is to come. Because here we read, he says, do not torment me. But in other versions, you also see additional details to what this demon was pleading. He was telling Jesus, please do not torment me before the time. And do not send me out into the abyss. Why is he saying this? Because this demon does not only have sound doctrine, he also knows truly what is still to come, what will happen at the end times. This is what we call eschatology. The demon knows what is prophesied and what will happen when the time comes. And they know that their time is about to end. And that's why they're saying, Jesus, it's not time yet. Please do not torment me. The demon doesn't only know exactly who Jesus is. He also knows what is to come. Jesus further on then asks, what is your name? In which the demon replied, my name is Legion, for he explains why, for we are many. They are a lot. There's a lot of them in there. A legion is a term that's used for a Roman soldier's battalion, ranging usually from 4,000 to 6,000 soldiers in one group. So you have an idea of how many they are. Don't know exactly how many they are, but we know there's a lot of them inside that man. And that's probably why he was suffering so much. This was not just a single demon possessing this man. There was a lot of them in him. And he was really, really having a hard time. Now, here's a very valuable truth. And I don't want you to miss this. Because if you read the Bible a bit too fast, you might miss this point. But notice what happens next. The demon sees a large group of pigs um, feeding in the nearby area. Then they ask permission from Jesus, please send us into those pigs instead so that we may enter into them. And Jesus gave them permission. Friends, this idea here is a very encouraging and valuable truth. It echoes what happened in Job where, you know, Satan was asking to do some things to Job. But, you know, he could not do anything unless God permissively willed it, unless God permitted it. The demons here could not do anything unless Jesus gave them permission. Why? Because God has absolute sovereignty and authority over this earth. God is absolutely in control. And there's a great relief here because some of us, 
if we look deep down, we may actually be thinking, oh no, there's an ongoing battle. There is an ongoing battle between God and the demons, but sometimes God loses a bit of control and that's why you know, the demons get an edge over him and so they can do so many bad things. No, it's not that. God is always in control. God is always sovereign. He has authority over all things in this realm and in the next, and in the supernatural one. God is always in control. There is not a war wherein God can lose. No, God is always on top, and He is always victorious. And everything that happens in our lives, in this world, throughout history, is always part of the plan and purpose of God that escapes our own minds. So take that to heart and be comforted by it. Because when you are in Christ, and even if you are not, God's plans are always playing out. God's purposes are always being fulfilled. None of it is by accident. And none of it has happened without the permission or permissive will of God. Whatever it is that goes on in our lives, it is always according to the plan and purposes of God. And I pray, as you enter into the new year, may that give you encouragement, comfort, and assurance. And now, after they come out of the group of pigs, they go, after they come out of the man, they go into the group of pigs, they lead the pigs to jump over a cliff, and they drown into the sea. Continuing on their desire of stealing, killing, and destroying, they all commit massive swine suicide together. And probably at that night, there was a large feast and banquet, and a lot of lechon probably in that area. But the group of pigs just basically jump off the cliff. Now, what can we learn from the second part of the narrative? Here's a thought. Why were these things written? Why were the Gospels written? Why were these narratives so meticulously written for all of us? We're not really sure for each and every story. You can have to read the whole context to understand the intent. But the end of the, Apost the, end of the Gospel of John, he gives us a glimpse, an idea of why generally the Gospels were written where he says that these things have been written so that, what, can we read this all together? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. What a valuable truth this is. That these things were written so that you and I would place our faith in Christ. And in so doing, we would finally have life in his name because the principle and the relevance for us today that we realize that you and i are in need of a savior and the truth is only jesus has the power and authority to save us and if you read the whole chapter if you read the chapters before this you see the power and authority of jesus playing out in so many ways like right before this jesus showed he had authority over nature Right after this, you see Jesus has authority over illness. Again, after that, you see Jesus has authority over life and death. And here, you see Jesus has authority over the supernatural realm. Right before he ascended, he reminded the disciples that, Lo, I am with you always, and that all authority has been entrusted to his care in heaven and on earth. Jesus is the one who has absolute authority over all things. And in fact, if we go back to other, our other casts of characters, when they encountered Jesus, none of them were left unchanged. All of them found a significant change in their lives. The Samaritan woman who was so ashamed of her sin, who wasn't even willing to go to the well when the sun was down so that she would avoid encountering other people, when she faced Christ in the well, she dropped her bucket, left it all go, ran back to the village, forgot all about her shame, and told the people that she encountered this man who had told her what she had done. Zacchaeus, when he welcomed Jesus into his home, he was greedy, he was stealing from his people, but when he encountered Christ, what did he say? Lord, I will give away half of my wealth to charity, and if I have lied to anyone, I will pay them back. 
That day, Zacchaeus let go of his greed because he had found something of far greater value, and that is Christ. The Apostle Paul, who spent his whole life living religiously, following meticulous rules, believing that he was good, believing that he was righteous, when he encountered Christ, what does he say? He says in the next epistles, epistles, he says, I count all of them as rubbish. I count all of them as rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ. The legalistic Jew was gone and he was now a minister of God's grace forevermore. And he gave his life for that conviction. Friends, you and I are in need of a savior. And only Christ has the power and authority to save. Because Jesus really is the savior you need. You and I were once captives, enslaved to this world system, enslaved to the prince and the power of the air. We were once a slave of sin. But when you give your life to Christ, all of that changes. Why? Because the Bible says, God himself came down in human flesh in the form of Christ so that when Christ lived, he lived a perfect life, but he died a sinner's death. Why? So that that perfect life he lived, he used as ransom and as payment for the penalty of our sins. So that all of us now who would believe in him, place our faith in him, it would be like we were taken out of the slave market and we will no longer be a slave to sin, but we will be a child of God. And that's the wonderful truth there. If you are looking for a new beginning, friends, that is the new beginning you need. That is the change that leads to all change. That is what will really satisfy your heart. Because throughout your life, you have been living a life in your own terms, apart from God. None of that will ever satisfy you. Because your heart will find its rest only when it finds itself in God. And when you come to Christ, you are now no longer living under this world system, but you are now in the kingdom of God forevermore, living in His presence for all eternity. So the question is, for those of you who may have not realized this truth yet, have not found this new beginning, Will you place your faith in Christ today? Because that is exactly the invite. That if you are looking for that new beginning as we start the new year, and you haven't found it yet, will you place your faith in Him today? Because that is the change that will lead to all things about you changing. And this is a truth that no matter what day and age, once you make this decision, it is timeless. It will stay with you for the rest of your life and for the rest of eternity. You will carry it with you and you will find yourself completely new. may not be behaviorally completely new, but you know something deep within you has really changed. That is the invite. That is the truth. That is the main message we have. If you are looking for a true new beginning, that is the gospel we celebrate. That's why we celebrate the Lord's Supper earlier because it is the most precious truth we all have. So with that, let's now enter into the third section, the third and final section. We have learned that Jesus has the power to save. And lastly, what is your response to this true new beginning? You tell others about your new beginning. You tell others about Christ. Let's go back to our story, opening our book once more. Let's bring it back. And we see, once the pigs jumped off, the herdsmen saw, they went back to their country and reported what had happened. And the people came. They came over and they saw Jesus, they saw the disciples, and they saw this man. This is the man that used to live in the tombs. This is the man that used to be naked, used to be crazy. But what is he now? He used to be violent and wild. Now he's calm. He's seated down. He used to be naked and now he is clothed. He is well properly dressed. He used to be out of his mind. He used to be crazy, and now he is sane. He is in his right mind. And here's the sad part about this. Because the light has come into the world, 
but the world was more comfortable in the darkness than the light because the light shed light into their darkness, into the desires of their flesh. When they saw this, surprisingly, they were so scared. They were frightened. They didn't know what to do with this whole circumstance. And you'd think that, yes, it's scary, but, you know, this guy, Jesus, he has just healed this man. He has made him sane. This guy was tormenting us. This guy was violent. This guy was attacking anyone who passed by. Jesus, come into our country. Come into our village. We will have a feast because you have done something new. You have healed this man. You have given us a miracle. You think that that's what they would do. But instead, again, the world loved the darkness more than the light. When they encountered Christ, they saw what had happened. They had become frightened. What did they do? They asked, Jesus, could you please leave our region? <laughs> could you please go away from this place? Because we don't know what to do with you. And that's very sad. Because again, Jesus is the Savior you and I need. And in front of the light of the world, they asked him to leave. Because they preferred the darkness more than the light. And so Jesus complied. He decided to leave the region. But here's another request. Here's the third request, if you notice. The first one was by the demons. Jesus agreed. The second one was by these people, in which Jesus also agreed. And here's the third one. As Jesus was about to leave the region, the former demon-possessed man, our garrison demoniac, who was now seen, he went up to Jesus. And he said, Jesus, can I go with you? And this is amazing because doesn't this sound like a Christian to you? That Jesus, I have tasted and seen your power, your message. I have spent some time with you and I now long for more and more of you. I can no longer live the way I used to. I now want more and more of you. I want to spend the rest of my days with you. I'm ready to leave everything behind and follow you. This guy had encountered Jesus and he realized the power of Jesus and he could no longer be apart from Jesus. He just wanted to be with Jesus more and more and more. But here's the surprising thing there. Jesus has had three requests, one from the demons, one from the people asking him to leave, the third one from this man asking him to follow Christ. And the surprising thing is, this is the only request Jesus declines to agree on. And you'd be surprised why. Because though this man wanted to spend the rest of his days with Christ, Jesus had a better plan in store. Jesus had a better purpose for this man. Where he says, he did not let him, but he said to him, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you. How he had mercy on you. Jesus had a better purpose for this man. He wanted him to go. He sent this man, the first Gentile he would ever send, to go back to his home to tell the people of what had happened, of the good news and of the power that he has witnessed. And though this man had a better pur had uh, something that he thought was better in his mind, he willingly obeyed. He willingly obeyed. He followed Jesus. He let go of his own personal opinion. He went back, obeyed Jesus. And what does it say here? He went back to the Decapolis. Friends, this is so interesting because he did not just go home to his friends, his family circle. The Decapolis is a term used for 10 different cities. He went back and shared what had happened to him across 10 different cities. And he just did that excitedly with zeal for Christ. And imagine the testimony of this man. Imagine if you could even say it. Hey, I am a former naked man who lives in tombs, but now I am sane because of the power of Christ. And though that testimony may sound a little bit crazy, it worked. He just said authentically what had happened to him. He had said, he had shared with the people of what he had seen. And the people were amazed. The people were amazed. This man became the first Gentile Jesus to send off. And he fulfilled his purpose obediently and with power. So what can we learn here? A few principles that we can learn from this last part. Something that I think is very powerful for all of us as Christians. 
that first is, once you are in Christ, and you have learned this, all of us are in need of a Savior, but once you are in Christ, you experience a true new beginning. And the verse here, 7 Corinthians, tells us that you have been made completely new. Everything about you has been made new. You have a new heart, a new mind. You have been set free from the captivity of this world. You are a new creation. And you hear this so many times when you talk to Christians. The things I used to like, I no longer like. But the things I didn't like, now I adore. I used to find the gospel and the Bible boring, sleepy, weird. And sometimes you may still do right now, but you know, persevere along. But you know, these things I used to find disgusting, but now I adore them. Now I find life in them. Now I can't stop reading His Word because in it alone I have life. What do we have to say? Why did that happen? Because the Bible tells us that the moment you have placed your faith in Christ, you were born again and you were made completely new. And you now have a new heart, a new mind, and all it longs for is more and more of God. Second, once you are in Christ, it's like you found something valuable, a treasure beyond all measure, and you are now so excited to share it with others. And that's what the guy did. He encountered Christ, he went back, even if his testimony is probably a little bit out of this world, he still shared it, and people were amazed. Because that's what you are like when you find something valuable. You share it with others. You know, over the Christmas break, we invited a few people to our place. And we have, since we don't have house help, we only have a dishwasher. And so every time we have some people over after they eat, I'd put it in the dishwasher. And I'd say, you know, you don't have to clean it because we have a dishwasher. I'll just put it in. Then after two hours, voila, it's all clean. And you know, I just shared because, wow, it helped our lives so much. It was so valuable to us. And they were amazed also. And because they were amazed, they bought their own. So I could be a dishwasher salesman. But anyway, that's not the point. So when you find something valuable, you will share it with others. What more if I was so amazed by the dishwasher? What more of Christ? What more of the gospel? In every conversation we have, especially with someone who probably hasn't found it yet, there's probably something in you saying, hey, share the valuable treasure you have found because it has changed your life, and it might change theirs as well. So it is incumbent upon us, it is innate within us, that when you have been changed, you would want to share that change with others. And lastly, as a third principle, and I love this one as well, because it's a great and humbling reminder to us who are in Christ, very humbling reminder, that though you may have your own opinions of what you think is best, God delights in our obedience more than sacrifice. And this idea comes from a story, uh, from a few stories in 1 Samuel, where you will see King Saul, who we know as a bad king, he wanted to do something for the Lord, and God said, do this instead, but he disobeyed, and he did what he thought was best, even if that in itself may not have necessarily been um, super corrupt. He disobeyed the Lord, and he was severely rebuked by it. He was regarded as an evil king because that marked his life. He disobeyed God and he followed his own ideas. But David, King David, wanted to build a temple for God, which again was also a good thing in itself. But God said, no, that is not your role, David. Instead, Solomon, your son, will build this temple for me. So what did David do? Did he go on and build that temple? Did he disobey God and say, you know, God, I think having a temple for you is still good. Let me build it up for you and then, you know, you can reprimand me after. No, David obeyed God and instead he prepared the items, the materials needed so that his son could build the temple. This demon-possessed man, he wanted to go with Christ. He wanted to spend the rest of his days with Christ. But because God said, Christ said, no, stay and go home to your people and tell them of what has happened. He obeyed because he humbled himself and knew that God had better plans in store. And you know what had happened after that? Interesting. Mark chapter 7, two chapters after that. When Jesus went back into the region of the Decapolis, someone brought him someone who was deaf and had difficulty in speaking and asked him to heal him. Now, why would this man ever ask Jesus to do this? Jesus had not gone back to this region Anytime 
before this, it was only when he had healed this demon-possessed man. This was the only time he went back to this region. But two chapters after this, he arrives and someone brings him a sick man, asking him to heal him. How would they know to bring him to Jesus? It was because the demon-possessed man, most likely, was faithful in the assignment he was given. And his testimony was going around in the region and already preparing the way for the ministry of Christ. This man fulfilled the calling of God in his life because he knew that was what truly was best. It's a great reminder, in my opinion, of a story of another famous preacher. You guys might know this man. Last time I was here, I shared three quotes by him. And frequently, people quote him left and right. This guy is C.H. Spurgeon. This guy, he has preached 3,500 sermons in his life, which has blessed over 10 million people. But do you guys know how this man came to faith? When he was younger, and he was 15 years old, he was going to church, and there was a snowstorm. And because there was an intense snowstorm, he had to side trip to a different church. And in that different church, the regular preacher who was there also couldn't come up because of the snowstorm. So what had happened? A substitute preacher who was super not prepared, <laughs> didn't know what to say, had to take on the pulpit. And so he went up, and Spurgeon says, this guy, the substitute preacher, because he was a substitute he didn't know what he had to say. He didn't know what to say. He was so very badly prepared. But thankfully, but thank God, he said, thank God he didn't know what to say. Because instead, he just repeated the verse assigned to him again and again. And the verse is Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me and be ye saved. Because it was old English then. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. And this substitute preacher just kept repeating this again and again. And he points out to the far part of the pulpit and he says, look at that man, he looks miserable. And going back to his verse, look unto me, he says, look man, look young man, look now, look now. And it was as if Spurgeon was pierced to the heart and he went home completely changed. Imagine the humble obedience of the substitute preacher. If that were me, I would probably struggle a lot. I have nothing prepared. I don't know what to say. But this man knew that he was being called by God to step out into the pulpit. And though he was not prepared, he just went back to his verse again and again. And because of that, this young Spurgeon was changed, experienced a new beginning, and spent the rest of his life telling people about Christ. And so tens of millions of people were blessed. And so this is a great reminder of what? If you are in Christ, you have probably said this before. If you are a believer, your life is not your own, but it is fully Christ. Do you remember that? The moment you place your faith in Christ, you probably said something like this. Lord, take my all. Take my life. I lay it at the foot of your cross. My life is not my own, but yours forevermore. And this is a great reminder of that profession of commitment of faith that you have made. That your life is not your own, but it's now fully the Lord's. And as you enter into the new year, as you enter into this fresh start of 2023, you may be thinking about, Lord, what is the new thing that you want me for this year? What are the new things you want me to do? And here are some thought starters that may help you get along your way, go along your way. Rather than what you want to do, have you inquired, what does God want you to do? Have you been spending some time reading His Word, knowing His general revealed will for all of us? Because if you do, you will have a semblance of what's right and what's wrong, of what's good and not in the eyes of God. Have you been inquiring of what God wants you to do rather than what you want to do? Have you been wondering, where does God want to send you to? What mission field is He calling you to? Rather than where you want to go. Are you just so excited to leave this job and go to another one? But have you ever inquired, Lord, is this the new mission field you are calling me into? Or maybe God wants you to stay, because by staying, you might bless some more people. Don't know. But that's something that needs a lot of prayer and discernment. And with the right heart, 
of asking, Lord, where do you want me to go? Rather than where, does, where do I want to go? And lastly, if you are in his mission field, are you talking about the gospel of Christ? Are you talking about the saving message you have received? Or are you just so focused on sharing your latest successes, your latest cuisines, your latest um, achievements over IG or Facebook or whatnot? But have you been sharing the gospel that has changed your life? Because this is a great reminder. Because it's not about what you want to do anymore, but it's about what Christ wants you to do. As a final bonus verse before we close, whenever I plan for uh, something new, whenever I plan for a project, I always go back to this verse because I find it so practical. It's found in James chapter 4. Where here, we don't have the time to go through it one by one, but here you see um, a guy is being rebuked. This guy has spent all his time, all his energy, thinking about, okay, how do I um, prosper next? How do I become more materially blessed next? How do I get promoted next? How do I get my next increase? What do I buy next? Etc. Etc. He was so focused on his plans for this earth. But he doesn't realize that his life is like a vapor. It can disappear at any point in time. You never know when your time is up. And so this verse is rebuking, not necessarily planning in itself, but people who plan without recognizing that there is more to life than this earth. And there is more to your life than yourself. That God has authority over all things. And He is the true King of Kings. And so when you place your faith in Christ, yes, it's okay to plan for the next year. It's okay to plan what you need to do next for the next few years. To have your short, mid, and long-term plans. But the reminder here is, the idea that's being said, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, wills, instead, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. It's a planning and a recognition and a surrender that says that, Lord, these are my plans. I pray that these are in alignment with yours. I have sought your will. I have sought your heart. I have pursued it. And these, this is what I came up with. I now dedicate this to you. May you use it for your glory. And if, Lord, you have a better plan for me and you would derail me from this, then praise God still because all I want to be is in the center of your will. All I want to be is in the center of your will and I know you have better plans in store. And so with that, I pray that your new year planning and the rest of your lives planning would be truly centered upon Christ. So as we wrap up, Let's summarize. We've learned three main headings. First, we all need a Savior. Second is that only Jesus has the power to save. And third is our response to the gospel of Christ is to tell others about Him. And I pray from all of this, you would really experience a true new beginning. Here's a closing illustration for all of you guys. That now that you have found a true new beginning, you know, as you think about the next year, Thanks, Brandon. As you think about the next year, and you guys have probably seen this illustration before. It's a very common illustration, but I think it's so apt for this time. Because a lot of us, we spend our days thinking about just this red part here in this rope. Just this small red part here. And this red part, this is our time on this earth. This is our lives on this earth. Probably... 60 years, 70 years, maybe even 80, 90, if we're, uh, if we're blessed by the Lord to stay here for a while longer. But that's it. It's just this part right here. But you know, this white part right here, this is so much longer. I can't even see the end of it. It's all tangled up there, but I can't see the end of it. It's a very long white part. And this white part here, this is eternity that awaits you. It's so much longer than this red part here. But here's the thing. We're so focused on this red part, but we're not thinking about how this white part will pan out. Because friends, we will all spend eternity somewhere. The question really is just, with whom and where are you going to spend it with? So instead of thinking about just this small red part here, 
and thinking about what you're going to do next. What's the next promotion plan? What's the next career shift? Where am I going to bring my family to next? Or maybe even what is my next vacation plan? Sure, all okay. But you know, these things are all limited to just maybe a line in this red part here. But eternity awaits you. And that is what matters most. We will all spend it somewhere. And I pray that today, as you ponder upon this, as you think about the new year, put in the forefront of your mind, have you made a decision to experience a true new beginning? Have you experienced the change that will really mark the change for the rest of eternity? And I pray you will make that choice right now to repent and believe and surrender all of your life. Make a choice that doesn't end only with 2023, but something that will matter for all of eternity. And so with that, let's bow our heads and let me pray for all of you. Father God, just thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your truth. But more importantly, Father, we thank you for your gospel message. We thank you, Lord, that all of us here can experience a new beginning as we commit our lives to you. We thank you, Father, for your sacrifice on the cross, that Jesus lived a perfect life but died a sinner's death so that I may have life. So that all of us now who would repent and commit the rest of our days to Christ would no longer suffer alone, would no longer live this life pursuing just things of this world, but we will find what our heart truly longs for, and that is you alone. Father God, for those of us here who you are moving in their hearts, I pray, Father, grant them the faith and the conviction, Father, to lay down all of their lives, to lay down all of their pursuits, to lay down all of their desires, and let them all go because they have found something, Lord, of much greater value, and that is you alone. Father, I pray may today be a true new beginning for all of them. May they experience the rest of eternity joyfully, delightfully, peacefully in your presence forevermore. And for us, Lord, who has already experienced this new beginning in the past, I pray, Father, help us to remember our commitment that we have made, that we have given our lives to you, and all of our lives are yours. Lead us to where you want us to go. We give you our hearts, we give you our lives, and we give the rest of our days to you. May it all truly be for your glory alone. We thank you, Father, for our wonderful time together, and we dedicate our new year to you and you alone. Thank you, Father, and we lift all these things up. In your mighty and holy name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless everyone. Amen. Can we invite everyone to stand up?